the fine art of probate, brought to you by Collier Bristow. Welcome to the Collier Bristow series, The Fine Art of Probate. During the series, we will be discussing a variety of topics in the realm of probate, all relating to aspects of art and culture. In today's episode, we are joined by James Cook, partner in our private wealth team, and Lila Kanna and Miriam Teeder of the Courtauld Institute of Art. Together, they discuss the details of charitable gifts and legacies, looking in particular at how the Courtauld navigates these processes and looking at the types of charitable gifts individuals often choose to leave upon their deaths. We hope you enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to another edition of the podcast series, The Fine Art of Probate. My name is James Cook and I'm a partner in the Collier Bristow Private Wealth Team. I specialise in trusts, tax and estate planning for high net worth individuals, entrepreneurs and business owners. And I principally advise on UK tax, estate planning, and my work often includes international elements for both UK and non-UK domicile clients. I also have a particular focus on philanthropic giving and the more complex probate, helping clients to maximise the use of inheritance tax base and exemptions where available. So today I'm joined by Lila Kanna and Miriam Tida from the Courtauld Institute, and we're going to discuss charitable legacies and gifts made on death. We're going to cover the types of charitable gifts that individuals can make, how these gifts are made, and the mechanisms behind them. We will also lightly touch on the tax implications, consider the best practice around these gifts, particularly in terms of restricted versus unrestricted gifts, and how charities work with lawyers other professionals, executives, trustees, families, etc. And then we'll end with our customary top tips. Uh, before we get underway, perhaps Lila and Miriam would like to introduce themselves and provide the listeners with a little more information and context about the Courtauld Institute. Lila, Miriam. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction, James, and for the invitation to join you today. I am the Acting Director of Development at the Courtauld Institute of Art and have nearly 25 years of fundraising experience here in the UK as well as in the United States. I'm looking forward to our dynamic conversation today about these important topics that you've outlined. And I'll turn over to Miriam and then say a few words about what the Courtauld is and what we do. Thank you so much, Lila. And um, thank you very much for inviting us onto your podcast, James. I'm Miriam Teeder, and I'm the Senior Development Manager at the Courtauld. And my responsibilities are primarily focused on working with individuals, trusts and foundations to secure the vital funding for the Courtauld. And I'm also delighted to be overseeing our legacy activity here. And all of this is with the aim of strengthening the Courtauld's important work to advance how we see and understand the visual arts as an internationally renowned centre for the teaching, research of art, history and a major public gallery. As Miriam said, uh, Courtauld is a robust and exciting centre based here in London, but in fact is far reaching and has uh, more than 8,000 alumni from across the world. We were founded in 1932 and the institution has really been at the forefront for the study of art, conservation and curating ever since. The Courtauld cares for one of the greatest art collections in the UK, displayed at the Courtauld Gallery, based at Somerset House. And quite notably, as some of our listeners may be aware, the Courtauld is a specialist university and home to the largest community of art historians and conservators in the UK. We offer a range of degree programs in the history of art, curating and conservation. We have terrific and vibrant young people's and schools programs and undergraduate and postgraduate graduate programs as well. We host a rich series of short courses and graduate diploma programs, for instance, in which we invite the general public to attend lectures that are hosted online as well as on site. Listeners have likely encountered one of our 8,000 alumni around the world if they visited any of the major cultural institutions, both locally or in their travels. Thank you for that introduction. And as we talk, no doubt it'd be interesting to see how the UK compares with the US as well. So Lila, we might touch on your US experience there just to see how far behind, say, the UK are. I mean, as a general rule on the charitable philanthropic given, we tend to be a little bit behind the US. So it'd be interesting to see some comparisons there. Or in fact, you, you may take a view that actually there's a few areas where, where we excel, but we're touching that, no doubt. So we, we can all agree that current times are very challenging for everyone, but particularly for charities. Um, charitable giving has increasingly become more important 
uh, charities has been stifled by the by their inability to fundraise during the pandemic and legacies on death continues to be very much a lifeline for many charities so we've we've noticed within our own sector a greater trend focus from high net worth ultra high net worth individuals towards philanthropic giving and from a very high level this can be observed from say the giving pledge where a number of high profile individuals have pledged to, to give money during their lifetime and on their death in fact the majority of their wealth during their lifetime and during their death or no I, I don't necessarily expect the call to be linked to the giving pledge or to, to necessarily have any benefactors from the, the giving pledge it would be quite interesting to find out how the call to have fared during the, the last 18 months, two years. Thank you, James. I think I'd say that the Courtauld has really depended on the loyalty and long-term support of our closest donors. We've been fortunate in that we have fared well and come through this period, which has been extremely difficult with both everyone healthy and well in our midst, but also quite frankly, with robust student population who's returning to campus soon and really our efforts to connect and maintain relationships as well as to perpetuate the community that we have that is around the globe, but really connect with our friends and loyal supporters and connect with hearts and minds in both promoting the content and creating even more access to the art, art history, conservation, and curating that we deliver and develop at the Courtauld. It's been a challenging time, but in fact, we've seen our general audience grow over this period, which is not entirely unique to the Courtauld. In fact, it's probably a perspective shared by many of our peer institutions. At the same time, I would be remiss if I didn't explain that it's been an incredibly challenging time, both in fundraising and philanthropy, and we know for so many of our listeners and our closest donors. And there was an understandable pause that was, I'd say, at least about eight months of last year as the world reeled and everyone really needed to assess their priorities. And whilst the Courtauld's focus is in creating new scholarship and research and perpetuating and promoting the value of art to life and society, clearly there was a time and a bit of a reset as everyone evaluated their priorities. But as you said, our donors didn't lose their affinity for the Courtauld. And we're very grateful for those who have stuck with us and have seen actually that those donors have come back with us as we're preparing for a very exciting future. Yeah, that's, that's, that, I mean, that's very promising just to hear, although you had a bit of a, a delay in terms of your donations and fundraising, but that's really reinvigorated in the last well, eight, eight months, 12 months uh, after the initial shock of the pandemic. So moving on from that, I think we should touch on types of charitable gifts obviously there are an element of lifetime giving so no doubt you have a large chunk of that from your funding where you have lifetime ad hoc gifts direct debits individuals giving on a regular basis and in many different forms that's not really the focus of, of today's podcast this is this is a probate podcast so we are going to focus on, on the death element there so moving on to giving on death um who are principally your donors and you have touched on this briefly before but principally who are your donors and 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 do you have a typical kind of supporter former student alumni does it expand beyond that as well I'll field this question as well, just to explain that we receive welcome support from our alumni, but in fact, our donors and corporate supporters are from around the globe. And I'd say that there's no set profile for a Courtauld donor, whether alumni, trusts and foundations, or, or corporates or other individuals. But as I was alluding to earlier, really what binds our donor community together is a belief in the power of art to change lives and improve society. And I'd say globally, our donors do subscribe to this. Gifts of all sizes really can move the needle at the Courtauld. And Samuel Courtauld may be perhaps our best known donor and founder. And he was really a champion of the ideal of art for all. And the Courtauld stands for this in all that we do. So donor support can promote new ways of learning and looking more closely, thinking more deeply and engaging more fully with art. But as you were alluding to earlier, we depend on the generosity of donors with gifts of all sizes to enable our vision. Great. And in terms of those gifts, are they a mixture of cash, art, property, business investments? So for, again, we have a focus on art in this context. So it'd be interesting if you have any examples or, or anything that you can talk about in terms of, of the art. Um, is that a regular occurrence? 
In an instance of a gift of art, there are considered discussions with actually a separate charity, which is maintained at the Courtauld, but is known as the Samuel Courtauld Trust. And the Samuel Courtauld Trust stewards the art collection and considers these with a focus on how best to grow the art collection purposefully and in such a considered manner that helps us as an institution deliver a greatest public benefit and exposure. Gifts come to the Courtauld in in all forms, as you were saying. There are also gifts of property, as well as gifts of appreciated stock that we receive, as well as cash, lifetime gifts, and legacies is, is our focus today. And I presume no gift is too small? No or... gift is too small. Absolutely. <laughs> really, I think what is magic at the Courtauld in particular is that it really doesn't take much to move the needle as far as the impact for support. Do you have any particular examples of, of how donors contribute to the Courtauld Institute? That, that you might want to share with us any particular interesting stories because like I say this the premises of this podcast is yes it's informative but it's nice to be interesting as well I wonder if you have any nice examples any uh, bursary funds etc that, that have recently been set up absolutely we have some very generous donors um, who for example are both scholarship supporters as well as having made provision in their wills um, for scholarships or other projects um, that we require funding for and the wonderful thing I think about establishing a relationship with us is that you can actually start to enjoy the benefits of following, you know, the scholarship to the scholar's journey or uh, watching a project come to fruition during your lifetime. And whilst knowing that this will continue in perpetuity and, and have a lasting impact beyond your lifetime. We have some wonderful legacy pledges um, who are a couple whose links with the Courtauld began around 30 years ago. And um, the relationship began with us when works of art belonging to them were restored by students in the conservation department. And over the years, they have followed the academic progress of these students who have, in, in their own words, become you know, really great friends. And as a result of this long-standing relationship with the Courtauld, they have decided to give back to the department and set up a scholarship to support students. And, and looking to the future, they have remembered the Courtauld in their wills to benefit students in the years ahead with their studies and careers. And then another example um, I'd like to share is is one of an alumna who enjoyed her studies with us so much at the Courtauld that as a result of this, she has also set up a generous scholarship, as well as having pledged a gift in her will to maintain her benevolence. That's that's fantastic. I think they're great examples of, and we'll come to this in the top tips, but I think this is almost a top tip in its, in itself in terms of engaging with the Courtauld and engaging with a charity as early as possible in terms of, of directing your legacy and, and having a real interest in that legacy and working with the, the charity and we find it as well from our own experience when we work with our clients at testators who prepare their wills and they really want to to leave a donation to charity. We actively involve them to engage with that charity, to start that discussion with them early, to work out how they would like their money to be used, what they would like to fund, what they'd like it to be invested in and really to engage that. And that in itself then produces this relationship. It builds up the rapport. And I'm sure that, you again, you've got further examples of how this then self-generates further donations, whether that be lifetime donations. You may have a client who comes to you initially who wishes to leave a legacy in their will, but because of the relationship you build with them, they end up leaving you a, an annual sum or they end up leaving you further donations throughout their, their lifetime because they're just engaged with the charity and engaged with, with the great work that, that you do. And I think that leads on to really the, the mechanisms around these legacies is in an ideal world i guess you would like a charity would like to have a regular flow of of donations a regular flow of funds coming into or, or artwork coming into into their charity so that they can fund projects and have this consistency and and certainty that that they'll be able to fund certain strands or projects um, going forward we also know that that's not the, the realistic thing here because often you get these ad hoc donations where you get cash legacies left under wills or you get a one-off donation and you don't know that they're coming, which I think is often a problem for charities and no, no doubt you'll be able to verify that. When we touch on that point, this is where the US element comes into it really because this is a very much a US concept in terms of gift agreements. But I understand that you've got some experience of gift agreements and how they then interact in terms of providing some element of certainty and building this relationship with your donor during their lifetime. I just wondered, uh, Lyle, in particular, if, if you could touch on gift agreements for me and, and how they're used, how the Courtauld Institute uses them and your experience of them. Because again, I think they are very much, and you'll be able to verify this, I think they're very much a US concept, which we're just beginning to introduce in the UK and some charities, including the Courtauld, are beginning to use them a little bit more often. 
So Lila, if you'd just like to touch on what, what is a gift agreement in the first instance? A gift agreement is typically used in the instance of a lifetime gift, and it is a non-binding legal agreement on both parties. James, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but they're not entirely enforceable in a court of law in the US. But they are important in establishing intention as well as mutual agreement about best use of the funds and to establish a, a set of light touch expectations for how the funds will be used, how the donor or their future generations might be informed about how the funds are used or in the case of a trust and foundation to continue reporting to that trust staff and, and board that oversees and has responsibility for the proper use of funds. The gift agreement, though, is an important structure to establish that common understanding. And it's also really important, quite frankly, for an audit trail that the institution is upholding the expectations and properly distributing or allocating the funds according to the donor's wishes. In the instance of a legacy gift, we would consider it atypical to have a gift agreement so much as a letter of wishes. A letter of wishes could be ancillary to the actual statement of an intention in, in the will itself. But And a letter of wishes could be actually quite short from what I would suggest, but it could in that instance establish an intent or an expectation of the way that the funds would be used by the institution. And that could be, in fact, as flexible as possible. In fact, we really do encourage it to be quite broad in its terms, and we can perhaps touch on that later. But And that is consistent across the US and a UK context, that the less restriction, the better for the institution that would be benefiting so that the funds could be used and rather than sitting unused and without a benefit to the institution or the long-term beneficiaries of the financial support. So in, in that context, you use them then primarily to liaise with the donor about setting out their wishes in advance is, is that the primary purpose here is so, so that you receive you know that the gifts come in you know their intention you know what they want to achieve like you say it's non-binding so it, or even though they've set out these conditions uh, they've set out these wishes the idea is that you would still have an element of flexibility that that you'll be able to divert those funds say you set up a bursary fund and that bursary fund is no longer funding a particular area of study but it's, there's a very similar area of study that you can then divert that across to is that the the intention of these gift agreements that is exactly and an example i could give to make it perhaps more clear is that say for instance someone might wish to support danish students to pursue study in a particular area of the history of art and therefore in their wishes they've expressed that preference. We would far prefer and suggest that, in fact, the preference is stated as broadly as possible so that it's not so much of a requirement or a preference, or even rather that it be perhaps for, instead, another example would be to, to provide financial support for undergraduate students with a preference for supporting students from underrepresented backgrounds. That's a very broad but impactful and I suppose, structured enough so that there's a statement of intention whilst being far more executable by the institution. And I hope those are two good illustrative examples to show what the difference is. The Fine Art of Probate, brought to you by Collier Bristow. Going back to gift agreements, my view is that they provide you with a little bit of certainty. Is, is, would you also agree with that point of view? Absolutely. And I think particularly dealing with international contacts too, I think, and thinking long term. So unfortunately, none of us are on this planet forever. Or maybe that's a good thing. And so having these documents also means that for longevity's sake and for the sake of an archive, that there is long beyond any of our lifetimes, particularly when we're talking about sums of funding that could establish endowments and really long-term benefit for an institution of consequence. It's important to have some sort of statement that is that you can follow 
in those types of terms so that it's not quite so personally dependent, but in fact is institutionally understood. Great. Thank you. So the gift agreements are used during, for lifetime giving and also for giving on death. In terms of giving on death, there are a number of different types of legacies or gifts that you can include. Typically, we'd include, say, a pecuniary legacy, uh, which is a, a cash gift. But the, the thing I was, the area I'd like you to just to, to talk about really is in relation to Pacific legacies and residual legacies and i wondered if you could one explain the difference between say a pacific legacy and also the difference between a residual legacy and then just talk about that within the, the context of the court order and if you have uh, the odd example there as well absolutely i mean to start by saying that you know anyone can remember the court order the gift in their will and um, whatever the size and as Lila mentioned as well, you know, it has been a challenging time for us um, recently with COVID and the impact of that. And coupled with that, obviously, government funding and tuition fees only provide for under half of our financial needs. And so we really do depend on donations from individuals to help us achieve excellence. As you mentioned, James, there are different ways in which you can leave a gift in your will. As you mentioned, there's the residual legacy where the gift is a remainder of your estate or a percentage um, after all other legacies have been made. And outstanding debts have been cleared. We we do like to see residual legacies because they, they do keep pace with inflation and they're an effective way to divide the value of an estate between a number of people and causes. Then there is a pecuniary legacy and this type of legacy is a gift in your will of a fixed sum of money. But please do bear in mind that its real value will decrease over time unless it is index linked. And then next, you can make a gift of a particular item, such as a work of art, property or shares, and that's known as a specific legacy. But if you are considering leaving an object to the court child, we would strongly encourage you to contact us beforehand to discuss your plans, because we can't always guarantee that we are able to accept specific items. Though, of course, we'd, we'd always love to. And that is because we not, might not be able to display them when the time comes, if there is limited space or they don't sit well in the collection. But having said that, you know, we, we do love to hear about you know, your plans and, and, you know, we'd love to discuss it with you. And then finally, there's another type of legacy called a reversionary legacy. And that can be the perfect way to ensure that your spouse or a loved one will, will benefit from your assets during their lifetime. And for example, by living in your house with all or part of the assets passing to the court hold on their death. And that can provide peace of mind that a loved one's interests will be protected during their lifetime. Thank you, Miriam. That, that's that's really useful. And it's very interesting about the Pacific legacy element there, because I, I imagine that some donors leave you leave you items that you can't, like you say, you can't home, you can't house, but you're very appreciative of, of the legacy. I wonder what you do in that instance if they do engage you would you then recommend alternative charities as, as a point of praxis there or, or is it very much you work with them to see if you can display their legacy in a certain way absolutely i mean we have very close connections the gallery gallery has very good connections with other institutions and galleries and they'd be very happy to recommend um, other options as well obviously depending on what you'd like to do so that's that's always something that we would welcome just to have that conversation in the first instance you know, do you always come to us first and discuss it because we have received some absolutely fantastic works of art in the past and so we'd, we'd love to hear more about it if you if you have anything you'd like to gift us in that way and the reversionally interesting point was was a very interesting point because i imagine and this is where we're moving more into the practicalities here but how do you actually find out if you are a benefactor under a will, I can imagine with a, a straightforward pecuniary legacy, a specific legacy, even a residuary legacy, the trustees often or the executives will get in contact with you. That may not always be the case. And it may be even more difficult where you're a reversionary interest, where you don't have an absolute right to that asset until, say, a certain event has, has occurred. For example, the life tenant has has died. How do you, and this is something I've always been interested in because I, it's a side that I don't regularly see. How do you hear about your, your entitlements under wills? That's very good question. I mean, um, the Courthold has access to a legacy notification service called Sme and Ford, um, and they inform us of sort of or charities of any legacies due to them once probate has been granted. And that would be the most common way that we would find out about a gift in someone's will. But um, we might also be notified by an, by an executor, as you were saying, James, um, professional or lay during the administration process. So both both happen uh, and both occur. But it's it's great to have the option of being notified by Sme and Ford as well. I wanted to touch, and this is very light touch on taxation. Taxation is obviously a very key element here, but it's it's not a tax podcast. We're not here to bore the listener about tax, but it is a, a very interesting point. And I'm sure it's one of the reasons, not the main reason, but one of the reasons why some of your donors 
give to the court order and, and give to generally to other charities. And firstly, on relation to inheritance tax, any gift to charity is exempt from inheritance tax. So that's always a starting point there. So again, that's beneficial. You give money to the court order institute, you, you don't pay inheritance tax. The other advantage there is you can obtain a reduced rate of inheritance tax. So if you give 10% or more of your estate to charity, then instead of paying the 40% inheritance tax on the rest of your estate, you pay 36% rate of inheritance tax. And this can be beneficial if you are looking to give a percentage of your estate to charity then it's worth doing the calculations to work out whether or not you should actually be given more. You can find that you can give more to charity and pay less tax and give more to your beneficiaries in certain circumstances. So it well, is very much worth doing the calculation there. And then again, on an income capital gains tax, so this is very much for your lifetime given, but there are certain reliefs and reduced rates that, that you can obtain for income tax and, and capital gains tax purposes. But in terms of the court tools donors, how much is tax? And this is a very general question. I'm, and I appreciate that you may not know the the full answer to here, but how much of that is discussed with the donors and how much of that is actually a, a, a quite an, a key part of their decision-making process? The tax benefits are really important when it comes to both lifetime giving and on death, as you said, James. And we're always keen to ensure that anyone considering a gift in their lifetime or as a legacy is aware of the terrific tax incentives. And we've gone to some lengths on our website, actually, where we have a section called Leave a gift in your will to delineate some of the details. And then we had a wonderful conversation actually with you, James, a few months ago as part of our legacy program, where we had a virtual event and discussed some of the tax benefits. As you say, it can be a bit dry, although quite frankly, we find it quite exciting and really is an important part of the mechanics of philanthropy, in fact. And going back to your initial question about some of the differences between the US and the UK, I'd say one area where the US and the UK are on par, but I feel as though there's more awareness in the US than here is focused on gifts of appreciated stock. And it's an area where the court hold has advanced a bit in the past year. And it's an area of great growth in both the philanthropy in the UK economy, I believe quite firmly. But to your point earlier about capital gains tax, I think gifts of appreciated stock and for lifetime giving are a really important and growing area where I would hope. That, and it's a very upfront conversation that we have with donors because they actually the mechanics are such that a donor would transfer the shares to the court hold and we would sell them and their tax basis then would be uh, they, it's uh, completely tax benefit to the donor in fact and then the organization receives the full value and they don't pay any capital gains tax on their appreciated stock no that's 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 very interesting that that like you say that is a very important factor during the lifetime given. And in addition to that, you've got these various schemes as well that the revenue have initiated the acceptance in lieu scheme and the the cultural gift scheme. We're not going to focus on the cultural gift scheme because that is very much a lifetime given element. So if we look at the acceptance in lieu scheme, I'm conscious that we have done a separate podcast on this. So if you are interested, if the listener is interested in acceptance in lieu scheme, we've done a whole 40 minute podcast in relation to that one scheme. But it would be very interesting to hear because this is a, an area that really fascinates me. And some of the items are just phenomenal. If you look at the Arts Council uh, magazine that they release every year, where they talk about the various items that have been given to the nation, it's just fascinating. I wondered whether the, the courts would have received any such gifts in recent memory. And, and if so, Perhaps uh, Lido or Miriam, you could discuss them with, with us and just tell us a few interesting facts about them. I really enjoyed listening to your podcast about the acceptance and lose scheme. And I think it did point out some of the terrific benefit. The acceptance and lose scheme, which we're discussing more so than the cultural gift scheme, is an excellent way to enable those with the liability for inheritance tax or estate duty to pay that liability through property, such as a work of art, as you were suggesting. And those works of art also, as you mentioned, are really of such a status standard of preeminence as set out by the Arts Council England that allows those works of art and those objects to stay within the country. The Courtauld has indeed benefited tremendously from the acceptance and lose scheme. And there are two stories 
two instances which we could relate to that scheme. One is around Lucian Ford's estate, which you actually addressed in that podcast that was previously recorded. And the Courtauld was the beneficiary of a terrific painting by Frank Auerbach, a work from 1962, which is now in our collection. And it's a work of art of uh, really of a value that the Courtauld would not have been able to acquire otherwise. The Courtauld has a very small acquisitions budget and we're a collection of collections, if you will. And so schemes such as the acceptance and loose scheme are tremendously important to the thoughtful and considered way in which the collection has grown. One story and object that has come to the court told very recently through the acceptance and loose scheme, which we hope all listeners will come and see and enjoy at the court told gallery from later this autumn onward, is manuscript actually uh, by Paul Gauguin. And it will be on display in our great room from later this autumn. And and that work would have likely left the country had the acceptance and loose scheme not existed. And we're terrifically grateful to the scheme and the Arts Council of England for donating the work of art to the portal. Thank you. I think I'm a big fan of the acceptance and loose scheme. And I just think in the last two, three, maybe even five years, the nation's kind of caught on to it. I mean, prior to that, it was very underused. And only now are they beginning to, uh, individuals beginning to, to use it um, and institutions are beginning to benefit from the various items. So I'm, I'm a big fan of the exceptions of Loose and I'm so pleased that the Courtauld has managed to benefit as well. The Fine Art of Probate, brought to you by Collier Bristow. I'd just like to go back slightly as well. We spoke briefly about restricted versus unrestricted gifts. And I know that this is a particular area that, that Lida and Miriam, you both want to focus on because it is important. And this will then revert into one, into our top tips at, at the end as well, in terms of the difference between restricted and unrestricted gifts. So just broadly speaking, the restricted gift is basically where you leave a legacy to a charity, the Courtauld Institute in particular, with a specific requirement. So it must be used for a said purpose. Obviously, that can be very restrictive. I previously gave an example, but you, you could set up uh, you want a bursary fund to fund a particular area of study and the Courtauld Institute no longer does that area of study. And in fact, it does a very similar area, but it's not the exact area that, that was mentioned in legacy. In that case, the legacy would potentially fail and it wouldn't be able to pass to the Courtauld, which would not be in the interest of the Courtauld and probably not in the interest of, of the donor in that instance as well. So where we have an unrestricted legacy is that you have no restrictions on that. So there, there are no conditions that are binding on that legacy yes you can have a wish and this is often where we have letters of wishes and um, it sounds as if the calls of institute a charity uses letters of wishes in a very similar way that a lawyer would in terms of a letter of wishes to accompany a will but sets out exactly how that legacy is to be used or how they would like that to be used but it's a non-binding obligation on their trustees in that instance or non-binding obligation on the the charities but in particular and i may have already taken the words out of your mouth here lila and miriam but what particular difficulties do you face when you have a restricted gift? I'd say that, as you suggested, the wording in your will is crucial to ensure that your wishes are fulfilled. So we do urge our listeners to remember to be clear whilst keeping intentions as broad as possible. There have been instances, in fact, where the wishes and the bequest have been so strict that we have had difficulties in being able to properly fulfill them. And I would guess that there are very few, if no listeners, who would like there to be some sort of legal tangle or delay in the implementation or deployment of their support for an institution or individual beneficiaries or an area of research with an institution. So in order to ensure that a legacy would reach us, we have specific instructions on our website and uh, most of our peer institutions do as well, where the name of the full charity is included with an address and what's known as an exempt charity number or relevant details, as I said, of whichever charity you've outlined. But we always, always welcome a phone call or contact from the donors so as to avoid any sort of tangle, as I mentioned earlier. I mean, from our instance, as well as, as lawyers, where the individual does wish to leave a legacy to a charity, but they do have 
a specific requirement or they have a specific wish over that. We tend to, and as we've said before, leave lessons of wishes, but a further way you, you can in, incorporate that, and this might not be necessary to the liking of the Coulton Institute, but I think it's worth mentioning, is whereby you, you leave a legacy to your trustees. And then you say, I, I express a wish that I would like to leave X amount or a percentage of my estate to my trustees to distribute to such charity or charities as they feel appropriate in their discretion. And then the letter of wishes would accompany that. So the letter of wishes would then set out their, their requirements, their specifications. At that point, the legacy is not directly then left to the courtauld. The courtauld of any said charity doesn't have an absolute entitlement to that legacy, but the trustees have the discretion to benefit them, providing that they're able to meet some of the conditions that are set out. I mean, that's probably not the ideal way for the courtauld institute because it doesn't guarantee the legacy. But from my client's perspective, it's a way of ensuring that you can have have that if they don't have that engagement with the charity prior to their death it's the way the trustees can have that engagement with the charity to make sure that the legacy can fulfill the requirements that the donor wanted the testator wanted to, to do so that's one of the other ways that, that we can incorporate those wishes within the context of, of the will it acts and I, we were going to discuss this, but it acts as, almost as a kind of a semi-restricted gift in that sense, because we we do have this restriction. We have the flexibility that passes to the trustees, the trustees then exercise their discretion. But there is this element of restriction condition on the legacy that they have to engage with the charity at the time of the death to, to ensure that that works. From your perspective, how comfortable would the court hold feel about that? I mean, legacies come to us in, in all sorts of different ways and, and we're notified in lots of different ways. And some of our conversations take place with lay executors and professional executors and trustees. And I think the key thing to remember is that whomever you're in touch with about a legacy is to remember to be show courtesy and sensitivity and clearly communicate at all times and, and always be open to discussing, you know, what needs to happen and, and what, what sort of basically how to fulfil the, the legator's wishes really in the best possible way that aligns with the court order or the institution that's benefiting from the legacy. And I would say that you know, when we're talking about the executors, that for example, with a professional executor, it, the conversation can be a lot more streamlined because there often isn't a personal connection to the legator and solicitors are, are trained in this area of estate administration, whereas a lay executor who may be a close friend or family member of the legator or a trustee as well, as you mentioned, James, that there obviously there may be feelings involved and they might be overwhelmed by the enormity of the role they suddenly have as an executor or trustee, and especially if they are grieving. So we do tend to be you know, tend to be more lenient when it comes to the executors and take a sort of a softer approach, really. But again, as I said, great sensitivity is always required. And we think it's really important at the court hall to make sure that we establish a relationship with the trustees and the executors and you know, invite them to stay in touch with us and invite them into the court halls so that they can they can see what their their loved one or, or their friends friend has you know wanted to achieve and and the you know the cause that they believe in and the meaningful way in which their their funding really is is supporting us in the future so i think it's really really key that we we sort of connect on that sort of really a much deeper level and involve them with our work in that way Great, thank you, Miriam. I, and I think that segues quite nicely into the next topic I, I wanted to cover. And in terms of dealing with executors and trustees, you, you spoke about dealing with, say, professional versus the lay individual and, and the great sensitivity that, that is required when you're dealing particularly with family members and trying to involve them in, in terms of the legacy and involve them in your charity and, and the causes that the donor or the, the testator uh, wanted to to benefit. But when dealing with professionals, I just wondered what your experience would be. And, and we have had some joint experience here because I have worked with the Courtauld, my colleague and I, on a particular matter where we have advised you where a, a professional, uh, well, advised you in relation to professionals' fees and and their fees on a particular state administration where the Courtauld was a benefactor. But I just wondered in terms of Dealing with professionals and trustees, how, how does that role differ? You said that you'll take a bit of more of a firmer approach. Do you have a high expectation there of, of a professional trustee, professional executor? That's, that's an excellent question, James. It, it is often more streamlined, but we do have to be very careful as well with, um, I don't know, I've got to be careful what I say here because you, you are a solicitor, <laughs> but it is important to, to check the accounts and be really clear as to exactly what time has been taken on the administration and what costs have been spent on the administration of the estate. So we really like to have sight of that as well as obviously the will to make sure that there isn't anything too dodgy going on and that you know, we really can protect the legacy and maximise its benefits um, for the charity and therefore fulfil the testator's wishes in the best possible way. But as you say, you know, there have been examples of that in the past where we've had to 
look very carefully into that and you've worked with us on that in the past and we just want to make sure that we really can make sure that the legacy is allocated in the best possible way and that the funding is protected. Yeah, but I guess you're treading that fine line between ensuring that you meet your obligations as a charity, which is in terms of optimising the legacy, optimising any donation made to the charity, but also trying to maintain those relations. And and I, I guess there's an element of PR and publicity there as well. We've all seen the charities in the past that have been stung where they've been over aggressive in their approach in these matters. So again, balancing that PR kind of role, balancing your obligations towards the charity commission as a charity and also balancing your obligations to the wishes of the testator and, and those surrounding members of family and individuals benefactors of, of the will so that, that i imagine can be very difficult and very tight kind of a uh, tight rate to, to tread at, at times i think we're coming to the point now where we can really talk about the conclusions and when we talk about conclusions i always like to end with a few top tips i mean i i'll start with my first top tip and it may overlap but my top tip would be very much engaging so I would very much ask for the my client, the testator, the person preparing the will, or even those given during the lifetime to engage with the charity during their lifetime to work with them in terms of their legacy, to gauge from them the interest, uh, what they want to focus on, what they want to benefit, how they would like their legacy to be used. And from that, you'll be able to ensure that the legacy can be directed and used in the right way. Again, I, I just wonder if you have a few top tips that you would like to suggest on your side. Absolutely, James. Um, I think what you're saying is is so true. And I fully believe in establishing a relationship you know, with, with the institution and with us as a court hold if if you'd like to leave a gift in your will to us. Uh, and of course, you know, we do appreciate that leaving a gift in your will is, is a personal decision and you may prefer to keep that private for whatever reason, but we would love the opportunity to thank you if you are happy to share your intentions with us. And it, it is not just helpful for us because um, it enables us to make projections but it also allows us to thank you in your lifetime and just show you how your gift could make a difference. And I should also note that we have a very active um, and wonderfully warm group of le legacy pledgers. And we would be delighted to invite you to join them, attend our annual legacy pledger event, hopefully in person again soon, as well as receive our annual publications, such as the Court Old News. And then my next tip would be to you know, consult a professional advisor or solicitor to have your will drafted or updated. But if you have already completed your will, I would now like to include a legacy to the Court Old. You can easily make an addition by including a codicil. And that's quite an easy way to amend your will without having to completely rewrite it. And I think lastly, and, and most importantly, once you have received the advice, it, you know, it's really important, as Lila was saying as well, to include the full name, exempt charity reference and the correct registered address, because without these details, it can't be guaranteed that the gift will reach us when the time comes. Great. Thank you. And I just want to, before we end, I thought I'd give you a, a quick chance to publicise the reopening of uh, the call talk. So if you just like to quickly <laughs> mention about your reopening before we end the podcast. Thank you for that opportunity. And hopefully the one warmth of the Courtauld has emanated from this podcast into people's cars and homes and, you know, our true gracious and gratefulness as, as well as our interest in connecting with those who are interested in supporting the Courtauld's vision and mission. And we are so looking forward to, as Miriam said, welcoming a community back to the Courtauld Gallery based at Somerset House and to engage with our programs around around the world online, uh, whether it's distance learning or through our open court hold hour. From this November, after about three years of closure, the court hold gallery will reopen its doors to welcome the public to view the reinstalled and reimagined permanent collection, which will be on view, as well as our opening temporary exhibition of terrific gift of art, actually, of drawings from Howard and Linda Karsham, which are part lifetime gift and part bequest, actually, to the Courtauld and the Samuel Courtauld Trust. We will have a very active program on site and online, as I mentioned, in gallery talks and tours, and it will be real celebration for the Courtauld and our both in our teaching and learning program and our offer, as well as in the gallery on site. So thank you. And we really do look forward to welcoming you all uh, back to the Courtauld Gallery after our closure and our transformation project. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Lila and Miriam. That's been fantastic. And I, I can't wait to visit the, the Courtauld Gallery as well in November. Thank you very much for joining me. It's very much appreciated and it is very informative and a useful discussion. Um, like I said, if you have any questions, uh, 
thereabouts, Chas will give in. By all means, please contact myself at Collie Bristow. And if you have any uh, questions about the Cools Old Institute in directly in terms of Chas will give in or just generally about the gallery and the charity, then by all means, please contact Slider and Miriam. Once again, thank you for joining us. And this has been the Collie Bristow podcast to find us Thank you.